Now, now I go back 35 years. Now, I don't go back, you know. It's a matter of... Jan Karski, born Jan Kozielewski, 1914, messenger of the Polish people to their government in exile during World War II, messenger of the Jewish people to the world, the man who told of the annihilation of the Jewish people while there was still time to stop it, hero of the Polish people, Professor Georgetown University, 1952 to 1992, and always immaculately dressed. Now, I go back. In my classes on the government and politics, I tell my students, governments have no souls. They have only their interests in mind. The common humanity of people, not the power of governments, is the only real protector of human rights. So I ask you, what is your duty as an individual? Shmuel Ziegelboy, remember this name. This man loved his people more than he loved himself. Shmuel Ziegelboy is what shows this total helplessness, the indifference of the world, the indifference of the world. What we are witnessing now is very discouraging. Every generation brings destruction, partition, violence, and yet there is this desire to preserve language, identity, culture. As a boy in Poland, we had to learn many languages because we never knew who would take us over. I was born in the woods, at that time one of the most multicultural places in all of Europe, where whether you are happy or unhappy, you always hear bells. By American standards, we were rather poor. My father, Stefan Kozielewski, had a small factory producing leather goods. I barely remember him. He dies when I am very young. My mother, Valentina Kozielewska, very, very Catholic, devotion, respect for others. She is making us in her image. In our apartment house, I remember in the yard, there, there were some boys, children, whom my mother called bad boys. They would sneak and over the roof throw dead rats, bad boys bad Catholic boys teasing the Jews, throwing dead rats at the Jews. Yashu, you come. You keep watch. Go to the sukkah like a good Catholic boy where the Jews pray, and you will watch. And if someone comes, simply call Mamo, Mamo, and I will take care of them. And I watch. My best friends in school are Jewish. They helped me with science. I help them with the Polish literature and history. There is Izio Fuchs, extremely religious. Everybody calls him Jewish prophet. He starts every sentence, I say. And then another one, Leiba Abushitz, is abject poverty, is a fighter full of hatred and resentment. He must have been treated badly. Izio tells us, I say we have to be friends with Leiba because if he doesn't find friends with us, where will he find friends? And then there is Salush, Isio's younger brother. Everybody loves Salush, but I, I like him better than, than most. He wants to be a pianist, but he, he will never play the piano for me. I, I don't know what happened. 
happens to them. Uh, my mother always said, Yashu, climb the ladder. Nothing will stand in your way. Go, go. So uh, I leave Wuj for university to study law and diplomacy. Jan Karski said, great crimes start with little things. You don't like your neighbors. You don't like them because they are different. Avoid this. Avoid disliking people. Don't make distinctions. He would often return to memories of his childhood as examples of these little things, these moments, uh, choices made or unmade that, that can uh, uh, illustrate uh, our personal responsibility as uh, individuals. So uh, after he left home, he began to pursue his career as a, as a diplomat, but when the war began, he was immediately sent to the Polish-German border where he survived the Blitzkrieg of September 1st, 1939. Poland loses the war in 20 minutes. He walks for 20 days, and then he is eventually captured by the Russians, then exchanged to the Germans, from whom he escapes by literally jumping from a moving train. He then walks 100 miles to Warsaw, uh, where he, uh, which he discovers is completely destroyed. Everything I have believed in up till now no longer applies. In Warsaw, he joins the Polish underground and uh, assumes his job as a courier, taking uh, information to and from the Polish government in exile in France. I become a, a, a tape recorder, a, a camera, a messenger. During his second mission, he is captured uh, by the Germans and tortured for three days. He tries to kill himself, knowing full well that he knows too much and he's afraid that he might break. He had taken an oath that he would do his duty even unto death. Well, the Germans keep him alive because they value him as a prisoner of war and they take him to a Polish hospital uh, from which he again escapes in the middle of the night, jumping naked from a third story window into the arms of the Polish underground, who then take him to a secluded farm in the Polish countryside to rehabilitate for seven months. He then learns that he soon will be sent to London and to America to report to the Allies, um, uh, take um, information from the underground to the Allied nations. The Jewish people also have an underground, and they learn of his mission, and in October of 1942, he agrees to meet with them in the outskirts of Warsaw. They beg him to take their messages as well about the extermination of the Jewish people to the Allies, while there is still time to stop it. They organize for Karski to visit the Warsaw Ghetto and a Nazi transit camp, knowing well that uh, when he makes his report, if he is able to say uh, that I saw it myself, it would strengthen his report. They implore him by saying, who knows, perhaps this will shake the conscience of the world. We enter the ghetto through this tunnel without any kind of difficulty. Uh, I am not disguised. Uh, he is not disguised, my Bundleader, my God. Uh, uh, I wore the Star of David. He put it on me. So we just walk in the streets. Uh, he is on my left. And, uh, we do not talk to each other very much. So now comes the description of it, yes? Naked bodies on the street, uh, corpses. I, I ask him, why are they here? He tells me, well, Mr. V told we have a problem. If a Jew dies and the family wants a burial, they have to pay tax on it. 
So, so they just throw them in the street. Women uh, with their babies, uh, publicly feeding their babies, but they, they have no breast, it's just flat, flat. Uh, babies with, with crazy eyes looking. This is not a world. This is, is not humanity. Streets full, apparently all of them live in the street. Everybody offering something to sell. Three onions, some cookies, selling, begging each other, crying, hungry. Children, horrible. The children running by themselves or with their mothers sitting. It is, it is not humanity. It is, some, it is some hell. We leave the ghetto and then he says to me, Will you go again? You did not see everything. I want you to see everything. So next day we go again, the same way, the tunnel. Uh, um, only now I, I am more conditioned, so I notice other things. The, the stench, the stench, terrible stench, everywhere, suffocating. Dirty streets, dirty, this, uh, nervousness, this tension, this bedlam. In Platz Muranowski, the, in one corner, there are some children playing with rubbish, throwing rubbish to each other. He, he says to me, look, they are playing. You see, life goes on. Life goes on. I tell him, they are simulating playing. They do not play. So we, we walk again for probably uh, one hour. We don't uh, talk to anybody. Sometimes he says to me, look at this Jew, a, a man standing without moving. I ask him, uh, is he dead? No, Mr. Witold, he is alive, but he is dying. Remember, he is dying. Look at him. Tell them over there in London, United States, that you saw it. Don't forget. We walk again. Uh, only from time to time he whispers to me, Remember this. Remember this. Remember this. I ask him, Why are they here? And he says, It's all right, Mr. Ravi told me, They are dying. They are dying. And always remember this. Suddenly, some movement on the street. People are running, fleeing from the street, dis disappearing. We jump into some house, apartment house. He pushes me to the window. Look, look. Two boys, nice-looking boys, Hitler Jugend, and the youth soldiers, uniforms. They are laughing, talking to each other in the street. Uh, every step they take, Jews are fleeing from them, running. At one point, one boy reaches to his hip pocket, pistol, target, shoot. Ah! 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 Broken glass, screams. The other boy says something to him. He is patting him on the back. And they just walk away. Some, a woman puts her hand on my shoulder. Perhaps she recognizes that I am not a Jew. And she says to me, go, go. This does you no good. Go. This was not humanity. It, it was not a world. I, I, I was not part of it. I did not belong there. I had never seen such things. I had never seen any theater. I had never seen any movies. Nobody wrote about this kind of reality. 
I was told that these were human beings, but they did not look like human beings. After two days in the Warsaw Ghetto, Karski is then disguised as a Ukrainian militiaman and he is taken to a Nazi transit camp where he witnesses hundreds, well, thousands of men, women, and children being forced onto cattle cars on a, on a train laced with quicklime. Haunted by his experience, but resolute in completing his mission, Karski arrives in London November 1942 to report to the uh, government in exile there as well as the Allied nations. There he meets with Shmuel Ziegelboim, remember that name. He is a Jewish leader of the uh, government in exile. After listening to Karski's report, Shmuel Ziegelboim, in deep despair, desperation, frustration, and rage, tells him that, I know this already. My family is there. What can I do? What can I do that I am not doing? This is madness, madness, madness. After several unsuccessful attempts to gain the attention of Churchill, Roosevelt, and the general public, Shmuel Ziegelboim commits suicide in protest of Allied inaction and addresses his letter to the President of the Republic of Poland. While Karski never discusses his wartime experiences with his students, whenever he comes to this point in his classes, he always tells his students, there was Ziegelboim. While in London, uh, he learns that he will not be able to meet with uh, Prime Minister Churchill, whom Karski is assured is aware of the situation, but is too busy. So soon he is sent to America, where he uh, reports to many leaders there, including Supreme Court Justice Felix Frankfurter. In Washington, I stay at the embassy. Polish ambassador comes with Supreme Court Justice Felix Frankfurt. He's a little man, but he did emanate some brilliance, very alive in his eyes. He calls me young man. Young man, do you know who I am? Yes, you are Associate Justice of the Supreme Court. Mr. Karski, a young man, I have been invited by my very good friend, your ambassador, to come here to see you. I was also advised that I should see you. Apparently, you have some information which I should know. A young man, do you know that I am a Jew? Yes, Mr. Ambassador told me this. Well, tell me about the Jews. We have here many reports. What happens to Jews in your country? What happens to Jews in my country? Now I become a machine, a, a tape recorder, a camera, a messenger. The man sits. I report. Jewish leader. Ghetto, death camp. I stop. He does not interrupt. I remember looking. He is, he is looking smaller and smaller and he is looking at the floor. Young man, as I mentioned, I have been informed about your activities. I was told that you came out of hell and that you are going back to hell. My admiration for people like you. And now. Young man, I am no longer young. I am a judge of men. Men like me, talking to men like you, must be totally honest. And I am telling you, 
but I do not believe you. Ambassador Briggs and Felix, what are you saying? He has been checked and rechecked 100 times. Felix, he is not lying. Mr. Ambassador, I did not say that he is lying. I said that I do not believe him. These are different things. My mind, my heart are made in such a way that I cannot accept it. I know humanity. I know men. No, no, no. Karski is finally uh, allowed or given audience with uh, President Roosevelt on July 24th, 1943. And while Karski attempts to address the extermination of the Jewish people in Poland, President Roosevelt does not ask one single specific question about it, and their meeting ends quickly. Traumatized by what he has witnessed and haunted by his own sense of failure uh, after the completion of his job. Carsey does not speak about his war experiences for 35 years until Claude Landsman discovers him and convinces him to give testimony for Landsman's uh, documentary show in 1985. And subsequently, he, uh, is, uh, he speaks in public um, and uh, Elie Wiesel, uh, asks him to speak at the International Liberators Conference in 1981. When the war came to its end, I learned that, that the governments, uh, the leaders, the scholars, the writers, said they did not know what was happening to the Jews, that the murder of six million Jews was a secret. They knew. Public opinion knew at the time. Governments knew. Intellectuals knew. Even if some didn't know, it was only because they didn't want to know. The Jewish problem was insignificant. The Jews were left alone to perish. My faith tells me that the second original sin has been committed by humanity through commission or omission or self-imposed ignorance or self-interest or hypocrisy or, or heartless rationalization or outright denial. This sin will haunt humanity to the end of time. It haunts me now, and I want it to be so. When I left the White House on that day in 1943, President Roosevelt was still smiling and fresh. I felt fatigued, but it was, however, not an ordinary fatigue, but rather the the satisfied weariness of the workman who has just completed his job with the last blow of his hammer, or the artist who signs his name under the completed picture. Something was coming to an end, and all that was left was this weariness. I sat on a bench in Lafayette Square, and I watched the people go by. They all looked uh, well-dressed and uh, healthy and complacent. They didn't seem affected by the war. Events passed through my mind in quick, strange fragments. The ghetto, the death camp, memories bringing nausea, the whispered words. Remember this. 